that our one prize possession is our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we began with asking the question, what currently, as of this moment, is our most prized possession? The thing that we cherish more than anything else. Well, we all agree that it's our soul. Now, moving forward from that notion, what are the things, and I'm talking about things, that we strive to possess more than anything else? What is our desire to continue to gain for our souls? Well, you think about this, we do desire riches, we do desire popularity and fame, because that's ingrained in our culture. That is natural. In America, we are not immune to the predominant thought that we have this right. We have certain inalienable rights. Right? Yes. Well, we have the right to life, liberty, and what's the final one? Pursuit of happiness. All right. Well, think about that. That notion. Is happiness the one thing that we desire the most? That pursuit of happiness. Is it? Well, sometimes it is. Actually, more often than not, it is. Many people say that, well, I just want to be happy. More than anything else, I just want to be happy. Have you ever said that? I know I have, many times. Well, that thought is rather appealing. Because you think about the other side of the coin. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I just want to be miserable? Nobody said that. Some people may operate in that manner, but nobody wants and strives to be miserable. But if it is our chief goal and aim in life to just be happy, well, where is that going to leave us when the happiness comes and goes like the wind, like a vapor? Well, we're going to be left to strive for more and more happiness. We're going to try to do, outdo the time before it. And where is that going to get us? Well, nowhere. Yes, we like to be happy and not miserable, but the Lord, He's worked a far greater desire in us. Through the Word of God, working in our hearts, we are convicted of our sin and we're led to repent of those sins. And consequently, the Lord invites us to come to Him when we are weary and heavy laden, and He alone gives us rest for our souls. So that is our desire, that we, we follow the Lord wherever He might lead us, because that's our purpose in life. The Lord has led us to follow the way, the truth, and the life. Now let's read together verse 34, that first uh, verse of our section today. Reading together verse 34. When He had called the people to Himself, with His disciples also, He said to them, Whoever desires to come after Me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. So the Lord has instilled in us the desire to follow him, and further persuades us to commit our lives to his service. Now we've been transformed from having the lone desire for happiness into people who love and desire to follow the Lord. Now looking at a different section of scripture, and it's actually Acts 16, uh, that section, it details for us the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Silas. Well, they got together with a lady, a lady named Lydia. And what happened there, that she was persuaded by the gospel to be baptized. And then, furthermore, Lydia persuaded them to stay with her. Well, why would she do such a thing? Well, because she wanted... She persuaded them to stay with her because she wanted them to continue to detail the Word of God. And she wanted them to encourage her in the Word. What they were doing is what we do quite often. That Christ believers gather together and bolster one another. They had their soul's welfare in mind with what they were doing. Now this happened. This happens uh, a lot for us too. It was actually uh, about two and a half months ago that I got a phone call from a guy that you know, Pastor Rob Sowers. And he called me up and he said, Hey, I got an opportunity for you. Do you want to come and preach at Bethel Lutheran Church in Morris, Minnesota in the last two Sundays of January? I hesitated for a moment and said, Well, 
Of course I would. That'd be great. So he persuaded me to come and do this. Now this is a good thing, because the Lord, he continues to use his people to persuade one another, to bolster one another's faith. We read about this very thing of what the Lord does for us by persuading us. From Romans chapter 8. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, there is an exercise that I wholeheartedly promote. Remember anything about me? What uh, exercise I like to do? Yeah, right, right here. Well, yes. That is good for the body. I uh, am a firm believer in that. Well, as opposed to running, I suggest an exercise which has us pause before engaging in any activity, no matter what it is, and asking ourselves this one question. Is this activity, whatever it is, good or bad for my soul? Have you ever done that before engaging in whatever activity that you're doing? Well, I believe that is not a useless question to consider, especially since our soul is our prized possession. In the middle of any day, go ahead and ask yourself that. Before you engage in some activity, whether it be at home, at work, whatever the case may be, ask yourself, is this activity going to be good for my soul's welfare? And then proceed with caution. Well, oftentimes when we're viewing our lives as Christ believers in this world, we view the law of God and we are convicted with our transgressions against the Lord. It's our usual practice to remember the sins that we've committed because they're acts against God. Well, let's look at one of the passages included in our section today and find out the other, other side of the coin of sins against God. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, we focus especially on the denying himself section. Now, even if you go for a day when you deny yourselves uh, pleasures, what it seems like to, to no end, well, what good are you actively doing? Well, you might consider that. Well, let's consider that often. In our confession of sins, well, we don't, didn't have it in the wording today, but often uh, back at Gift of God in Mapleton, we detail in our confession of sins, we say, we ask the Lord for forgiveness for what we have done and for what we have left undone. Now, it'd be easy, or it'd be going too easy on ourselves for us to repent of those sins that we've done, and I'll leave it at that. No, instead we shall continually keep in mind the directives from the Lord that we have left unfulfilled. Forgive us for what we have left undone. Now, uh, today, one of the commandments that we study, well, that we study for this week, I asked uh, Pastor Sowers to include it in the bulletin today, and uh, hopefully he did. I think he put it in for next Sunday. Anyway, uh, that's all right. It's uh, the seventh commandment. I'm going to read that for you. You can chime in if you uh, know it as well. Seventh commandment, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions, nor get them in a dishonest way, but we should help him to improve and protect his property and way of making a living. Now looking at the seventh commandment, we might quickly respond to that commandment and say, well, I haven't actually physically stolen anything from someone, therefore I don't have a huge problem in keeping this commandment. Is that right? Well, that's not the heart of the commandment. Now, in my heart, one of my defenses that unduly enters my mind is saying to myself, well, I did nothing wrong. Have you ever said that to yourself? Well, looking back on certain things that transpire, maybe it's uh, a relationship with somebody else, maybe with your spouse or your parents or whoever, you might say to yourself, well, I didn't do anything wrong, so therefore why am I being punished? Well, at the same time, we should talk to ourselves and say, well, we didn't do anything right either. We didn't do anything right or good in serving the Lord. 
You see, refraining from doing evil and committing sins, well, that's one thing. That's a fine attribute that the Lord has instilled in us as a new creation. Just like with Abram, he gave him a new name, Abraham. Well, that's what the Lord has done for us, too. He's made us new creations. But what about the active part in serving God? Oftentimes we take false comfort and false security to what, or in the sins that we have not committed. Well, quickly let us turn our attention to what the Lord would have us to. Now, that saying is true. Maybe you can uh, fill in the rest. Idle hands are the... Yeah, they really are. No, instead, spreading God's word, it's light from age to age. Well, that should be our, it shall be our chief endeavor. We sing about that in our worship services. That's our active part in sharing forth the gospel message. Let me make a personal note here. Uh, I was going to use my daughter as a um, an analogy, but she's not here. Um, she will be next Sunday. Well, a little while ago, we went skiing at uh, Detroit Mountain. You ever been there? That's a great place to go and ski. Well, anyways, we were there for the first time. And one of the best moments that we had while skiing is that going up the mountain is that we began to sing the song. She actually started it first. I'll give, give her the credit. She started singing, Go tell it on the mountain. And I thought, you know, that's really good. <laughs> that, uh, sure, we're here to have fun, but at the same time, what is our chief endeavor? What is our main goal? To go tell it on the mountain. To tell about what the Lord has done for all of us. So our chief endeavor shall not be just refraining from stealing, from killing, from harming others. No, our chief endeavor shall be to actively help those who need the gospel message. And who needs the gospel message? We do. Everyone does. So yes, one of the greatest things which we have in our possession is God's promise to us. Yes, our souls. The Lord makes a promise like the ones that we read uh, he made to Abram and the ones he made to Jacob. And what is the percentage of chance that he's going to keep that promise? It's not 99.9. .9, it's 100%. Who can make a promise with there being the absolute guarantee that it will come to pass? Well, only God. The devil makes promises that he will give us the world, but in the end, there's no chance, there's no possibility that he'll make good. We of ourselves have and make promises to other people, even to our loved ones. But what is our track record? Well, it's sketchy. So even though we live our lives resting on the sure promises of God, the worldview of how we lead our lives, that's very skeptical. You think about this. The life of a Christ believer, a Christian person, it's not an appealing one to human opinion. I say that because of what we are told in the second part of verse 34. Let's read that together. It's the second part of verse 34. It starts out, whoever desires. Let's read that. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So looking at that, the rest of the world looks at us as Christ believers and, say, and says, why follow a God that tells you to take up a cross? To take up a burden? Why would you want to do that? In fact, we have many crosses to bear. Why would a person follow a God who allows more heartache, more pain, more suffering to occur as a direct result of following Him? That's the kind of question that the world asks. But what they don't realize is that the cross is that uh, Christ bore the cross that we could never bear to pay for all of our sins. He bore the whole world's burden of sin so that we have the forgiveness in God's sight. Furthermore, however heavy the crosses that we have to bear in the Lord's name, well, who helps us bear it? Well, it's the Lord Himself. Let us thank the Lord for taking the burden of sin off of us. And ask him to support, or for support, to bear our own crosses. In fact, one of the uh, best Christmas cards that I got is from my, my sister's uh, mother-in-law. It just had the one simple line. It just said, 
We owed God a debt that we could never pay, and Christ paid the debt that we could never pay. What an awesome thing that is. Well, let's continue in our section, reading on with verse 35. Can we read together? For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. So today we have spoken what our prized possession is. It's our soul. If a person's whole goal in this life on earth, if a person's whole goal in this life is for this life on earth, well then what occurs in the end? Well, as Jesus told us, he's lost. But consequently, he goes on to tell us that he, if he actually loses his life, not just desires to, but actually loses his life, that means gives it over to Christ, well then, he'll win it because of Christ. Now, we'll continue with a few questions to put things in perspective, so that we have a clear understanding of what our souls mean. Verse 36. Let's read that uh, verse together. It's a question. For what will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So that question, it rings in our ears. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Now, it's, it's not exaggerating here. It's talking about the whole world and all the gold and silver and everything in the world. But, loses his own soul. Well, let's break it down a little bit. In the business world, there are really only two ways to look at things. If you take it down to the base level, there are profits and losses. Does the company end up being in the black or in the red? That's always the key question. Taking in more money than is being spent. That's the idea, right? Profit. Well, instead of a business, let us look at one single human being. Does the profit of appearing to gain the whole world, all its riches, outweigh the loss of one's, of losing one's soul? Does it? No. Not a chance. Is that an actual profit? No. Because what's left? If you lose your own soul in the process of gaining the whole world, what are you left with? Well, nothing. Your soul's going to end up where? Well, in hell. <coughs> Certainly, the loss would outweigh the gain. And then the next question that he poses. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, we're revisiting that whole loan idea once again. Once a person secures that loan to buy that dream house that they've always wanted, well, who is it that owns that house? Well, it's not the person. It's the bank. Yes, over the course of time, you exchange money, for the right or the deed to the house, but still in the end, when you die, who owns that house? Well, not you. It, the house decays, just like everything else in this world. So is there anyone that has an idea of the value of a person's soul? Is there? Well, there is no equivalent in value or price for heaven, for a person. Let's read together the final uh, verse of our section today, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with holy angels. So putting it bluntly, Jesus tells us, well, of what are we ashamed? Well, we shall be ashamed of ourselves. We shall be ashamed of the sins that we have committed against God. What we have done and what we have left undone. But it is our prayer today that we have been granted the vision to see clearly what is our prized possession. And that is our soul. And that we will continue to entrust Jesus with the care of our soul. We pray that we shall never be no, never, ashamed of Jesus and what he has chosen to do for us. May it never be, as Jesus tells us, may it never be that Jesus despises to call us his own. Instead, may we continue to live full and rich lives 
entrusted with the care of Jesus and what he has done for us. We end with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, for our soul's security. He is our most prized possession, and we ask that you continually lead us to trust in him forever. In his name we pray. Amen.